Hey church, pumped to be with you today. We're going to be kicking off with part six of our conversation, Just Like Jesus. And it's my privilege to be able to be sharing the word. So wherever you might be uh, watching along with us, Scatter Sunday, it's going to be an impactful time together. So, hey, if you've got a Bible, uh, make sure you've got it out. Maybe if it's on your phone, feel free to load it on up. If the person next to you is already on Instagram, just give them a gentle nudge. Say, hey, no hashtags yet. Wait till a bit later on. Um, we are going to jump into this passage of Scripture found in the book of John that we've been working our way through together as a church community. And we're going to be kicking off with chapter 3, uh, reading through from verse 1. So follow along with me if you will. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Great question. Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans re can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So you can't explain how people are born of the spirit. In verse 9, how are these things possible? Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Verse 16, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. And in verse 21, but those who do what is right Come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Man, what a brilliant passage of scripture we've got for us uh, today. And maybe to kind of uh, tick over in your mind, I've titled our message uh, today, This is Really Good News. This is really good news. And I want to encourage you, wherever you might be watching your scatter party, um, you know, when questions come up, make sure you press pause because we want this to be a conversation, a discussion. It's not just simply about sitting and listening to me, but it's also about the community that you're with right now and wrestling through this passage of scripture together. So get the remote ready. Maybe if you've got it on a VCR, I don't know how that could happen, but hey, <laughs> Rustle up the remote wherever it is uh, and be ready when we do that. I want to ask you a question straight away. Have you ever been in a situation where you've wanted to ask uh, more, like you want to find out more information, but you felt maybe a little bit embarrassed, a little bit intimidated, a little bit uncertain, um, and so you've kind of stayed silent. You've not really gone and found out uh, more about that situation you found yourself in. So why don't you just... Consider that for a moment. We'll be back in a second. That situation happened to me a couple of years ago. My wife and I have got three beautiful girls, and I was 
lucky enough, blessed enough, dare I say, uh, to be the only parent present when our eldest daughter went to school for the, hey, I'm finding out about what's happening to my body talk. Man, now to give you some context, I grew up with only a younger brother. And so when it comes to the wonderful world of ladies, you know, I'm a bit of an amateur. I'm not going to lie to you. So here I am turning up slightly late, just late enough so I got to sit in the front row with my daughter at this talk about what's happening to her body, the puberty talk. And man, did I have a bunch of questions. (laughs) Did Brendan put his hand up? Not at all. I was way too intimidated to. And so in my mind, I'm just like, man, I'm going to have to Google this later. I've got to work out what, what exactly is going to happen. But you've got to play it cool, don't you? You've got to just go, okay, yep, mm-hmm, taking it all in. I say all that to say that Nicodemus, to give you some context, is in a very similar situation. Nicodemus is this Jewish leader, this religious leader. He, as a matter of fact, Scripture tells us he was part of the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish ruling council. About 71 of the most respected, influential Jewish male leaders made up this council. And even though Israel at the time was dominated politically and militarily by the Romans, they let them make some judgments on their own things, particularly around religious issues and some small civil matters. And so Nicodemus is on this council. He's a very learned man and he's heard about what Jesus has been doing. He's heard of some of the signs that Christ has done, but because of his position, maybe because of his uh, feeling, maybe because of his sphere of influence, he doesn't kind of come straight up to Jesus because it's interesting to note in the passage of Scripture that he comes to him at night. Comes to him at night. That brings me to my uh, first uh, point or thought or truth for us today, that it doesn't matter how you come to Jesus, just that you come to him. Just that you come to him. And I love the fact that Nicodemus, he says, and we read it here, he says in verse 2, Rabbi, really interesting that he shows reverence to Christ. I love it. He said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. So he's making this statement to Christ. But what is so beautiful about the fact of when we come to Jesus is that Jesus can actually answer the real questions that are on our heart. Look at this. In verse 3, Jesus replies, I tell you the truth. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Did Nicodemus say, hey, Jesus, how do I get into the kingdom of God? No. No. But it's an issue, it's a burning question on his heart. Because as a religious Jewish leader, Nicodemus knew the Old Testament inside and out. We can remember from a few weeks ago when Pastor James taught about that and the process that young Jewish men went through in their training and their memorization uh, of the Torah and the books of the Old Testament. Uh, So for Nicodemus to be in his position, we know he's a very, very smart, influential man. And so in his mind, you can imagine he's wondering this kingdom of God that the Old Testament talks about that will be fulfilled one day. When is it coming? It's on his heart. And I love, man, I love the compassion of Christ that he answers that question. And he answers it with truth. I tell you the truth. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter how we come to Jesus, just that we come to him. You see, for some people, we have a view of uh, Christianity, of those who follow Christ as though, oh, look, to be honest, it's only for those people. It's a bit of a crutch, you know. It's kind of those people that just can't get their life together, so they turn to Jesus. Isn't that lovely for them? Some of us, and you know, like some of us, we kind of think maybe, ah, it's for the real down and out person. Yeah, they do need Jesus, but I kind of got it together and, you know, my job's kind of coming back and COVID didn't impact me too much, so I'm kind of sweet. Nicodemus would have been one of, as I've said, the most influential men in Jerusalem at the time. He's together intellectually. He thinks he's together religiously. He's together socially. Economically, he would have been a very wealthy man. His status in society, I don't know if we can necessarily completely understand. It's almost like he's a pseudo-celebrity, yet he comes to Jesus. He comes to Jesus. He needs Christ. And the truth is, whether we feel like we've got it together or not, we need Christ. And the beautiful truth in that is that it doesn't matter how we come to him, 
just that we come. We'd have to try and kind of dust ourselves off, pull ourselves together, kind of feel like if I get these few things right, then I'll come to him. I'll I'll get rid of a few of these bad habits and then I'll come to Jesus. That's not the case at all. Just come to him. Just come to him. That is the main thing. That's my first thought for us uh, today. The second thought I've got is this. We need to be reborn. We need to be reborn. Jesus says that to Nicodemus. And for Nicodemus, as a Pharisee, a Pharisee was one of a religious sect at the time that were strictly observant to the Old Testament laws, to the laws of Moses, and then also to the oral traditions that have been passed down throughout, passed down throughout the centuries. So Nicodemus is a man who is like uber religious. You know what I mean? Uber religious. And yet Christ says to him, you know what, mate? Well, he doesn't say mate, but in my translation, he does. <laughs> he says, you need to be reborn. When we come to Christ, we can't consider him to simply be like a, a spiritual guru or a self-help icon. I don't know if you saw on Netflix a few years ago, but there was a documentary that came out by, uh, about Anthony Robbins, who is the American kind of coach, self-help guy, massive chin. And, uh, and the, title of, the title of that documentary was, I Am Not Your Guru. And I thought, what a brilliant statement. Because you see, if we think that coming to Christ is simply about getting some self-help, it's still all about what we need to do. It's about us trying to pull ourselves together. It's trying to schedule and structure and establish enough good habits to be like, you know what, I'm kind of getting it right. If we think that Jesus is simply only a spiritual teacher, then all of the onus is still on us. And I don't know about you, but I know myself too well. And I know if it's up to me, I'm going to kick off great for the first three hours. And then the wheels are going to fall off. They're going to come off so bad. I need, I need to be reborn. We need to be reborn. It's like this idea. Uh, I'm old enough or of a vintage enough to remember um, Commodore 64s. And, you know, maybe the person next to you on the lounge does remember that but doesn't want to acknowledge it. It's okay. Just give them a little gentle smile. Yeah, I know. And for those of you who do remember the Commodore 64, and I know there's some of you here even now, um, this was the joy of the Commodore 64. Selecting a game, putting that game into load, going off to have dinner, doing the dishes, finishing all of your chores and come back to find that it has finally loaded. Oh, what a simple joy. You've probably got about five minutes left before bedtime and then you've got to turn the thing off anyway. A Commodore 64, it was like one of the most basic first personal computers. Now, could you imagine having a Commodore 64 today and be like, oh, I've just got to jump on eBay, buy a couple of things quickly. I've got to check my bank account. Then I want to see the score in the footy. And then I've got to upload a few photos to Instagram. There is no way a Commodore 64 could ever handle anything, anything that a computer today can do. You don't need to kind of drag your Commodore 64 into the future with it. You need a brand new computer. If we try to drag our old selves into a righteousness or a right standing with God, man, we're going to be found so far short. We need to be reborn. We need to be reborn. We can't do it in our own strength. And you know what? That is actually amazingly good news because it frees me from trying to have to perform to please God, but know that all I need to do is believe in Christ, be reborn. That changes everything. Game changer, game changer. So it doesn't matter how we come to Jesus. We need to be reborn. Here's a third truth for us in our time together today. You are loved by God. You are loved by God. John 3, 16 is one of the most well-known passages of Scripture for a reason. It basically summarizes the whole guts of the Bible. It summarizes for us God's heart towards us. And how does it start? For God so loved. Now, 
This is mind-blowing for the people of the day. When John writes this, they're in a context in which God's love is directed and demonstrated towards a particular racial group, the Jewish people. But this statement here in John 3.16 blows that way out of the water. Because it doesn't say that God so loved just Jewish people. It doesn't say God just so loved really good people. It doesn't say God so loved people that seem to have the form or the function of religion. It says God so loved the world. The world. Man, that is every single one of us. In our brokenness, God loves us. And I know it sounds like a Captain Obvious statement, but I want to say to you, If you've known Jesus for a while, if you've been walking in the way of Christ for a little while now, do we just kind of brush over that statement as in, oh, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, God loves me. We need to remind ourselves and remember the enormity of that statement. You see, God's not this awkward sports mascot running around trying to get cuddles like, love me, love me. That's not what he's about. This is God, the creator of the universe, the heavens and the earth. Scripture tells us that he stretches out the expanse of the universe like a sheet, that he breathes stars into existence, considers the earth his footstool, and in all of that enormity knows the immense intricacies of our human body, so much so that he knows every hair on our head, even if they're starting to fall out. The count's going down, God, let me tell you. (laughs) So for someone like that to love me, to love you, man, that is huge. And that is game changing. Never be so comfortable with that statement that we become haphazard about it. Yeah, Yeah, that's great. God loves me. Oh, yeah, that's cool. God loves me. No, no, no. God loves you. John, in another one of his letters, 1 John in chapter 4, I think it's in verse 9, he says, we love, verse 19, sorry, we love because he first loved us. And when we remember that truth, it enables us to live in a place where we are loved. We can receive that love from God, hey? Man, that statement is so powerful. You are loved by God. So it doesn't matter how we come to Jesus, guys, does it? We need to be reborn and we are loved by God. Now, with those kind of thoughts in mind, I just want to uh, throw another question at you. Have you viewed your Christianity? For those of you who are watching along, who know Jesus and follow his way, have you viewed this idea of Christianity as simply an addition to your life or the totality of your life? We'll be back in a second. Beautiful. It's a, it's a confronting kind of question, isn't it? But it's a great reminder. It's something we need to remind ourselves of, that Jesus isn't just simply a little, you know, totem in our pocket that we pull out when we're in trouble, but actually he brings rebirth to our life. And so that drastically changes how we live. All right, we're going to continue on through. Uh, it's interesting what is written here when Jesus talks to Nicodemus and says that uh, just as Moses lifted up the snake, oh, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now, this is alluding to a passage of Scripture found in the Old Testament in the book of Numbers when there is this um, account that happens. The, to give you some context, the people of God, they're in the middle of the Exodus. They've been uh, set free miraculously from their enslavement in Egypt. They're making their way to the promised land and they're making it via a pretty major detour in the desert. Now, there's one account, one moment that happens where they start grumbling again. It's a bit of a common theme as they're making their way towards the promised land and I used to always be like oh man why are these guys whinging and then I look at myself I'm like oh flip I whinge quite a bit also Um, and what's happening is they're just complaining again to Moses like why have you taken us out of Egypt oh we're gonna die in the desert and in the midst of all of that God actually uh, sends this kind of like judgment moment to them where all these snakes appear and start biting them and these people start dying it's pretty horrific account that happens in numbers And then the people cry out and Moses goes to God and God says, all right, this is how the people are going to be saved. Make a bronze snake and lift it up. And everyone that looks at that snake is going to be saved. 
Now, you can kind of think like, man, that's kind of a weird bit of a crazy thing that's happening in the Bible there. Look, come on, let's be true. It's a bit crazy out there. But it's actually also, not only did this account happen, but it's also a foreshadowing of what was to occur with Christ. And so Jesus says this to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus understood this story instantly. Can I tell you in my fourth point for us today that a reborn life has a refocus? A reborn life has a refocus. Jesus says that, you know, just as the snake was lifted up, so he must be lifted up. And so that draws to us the fact that our focus needs to shift when we come to Christ. You see, it doesn't matter how we come to him, which is so beautiful. We know we need to be reborn, which is brilliant because it's not now about me and my effort. And I'm so loved by God. Knowing all of these things, my focus now shifts to Christ. And not only just Christ crucified, but listen to this, Christ crucified, Christ resurrected, and Christ ascended. I want to unpack that quickly for a moment. We remember Christ crucified because in that account, what happens on the cross is that our sins are forgiven. Christ takes the place, the judgment that I deserve because of all of my brokenness, bad stuff, sin. Jesus takes that place. Man, I never want to forget that. I always want to be so thankful. But it doesn't just end there. Three days later, Christ rises. He is resurrected. So much is this a significant element of the faith of Jesus that Paul writes that, you know what? If Christ wasn't resurrected, man, all of this is for nothing. The resurrection of Jesus is vital. We remind and remember ourselves, remember this at Easter time, of course, but constantly let's remember our focus, Christ crucified, Christ resurrected. And then listen to this, Christ ascended. Now, Christ putted around for a bit, showed himself for about 50 odd days to the disciples, went to Thomas who was doubting, showed him the holes in his hands and in his side. And then after all of this, Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to prepare a place for you. And as I go, the Holy Spirit's going to come brilliant. Now, here's a really cool thing to think about. What is Jesus doing right now? Well, not only is he preparing a place for us in heaven which is such a beautiful promise but scripture also tells us that Christ sits at the right hand of the father and he intercedes for us he's praying for us now I've known some people that are pretty cool prayers in my time you know what I mean like maybe you're in a room with one pretty cool prayer right now but of all the people you would want praying for you Jesus has got to be up there doesn't he And I love reminding myself of this fact, that my focus now shifts to Christ. That's why this is really, really good news. I shift my focus to Jesus. I remember what he's already done for me. I remember what he's going to do for me. And I remember his role right now for me and for you. So a reborn life has a refocus, a different focus. I want to encourage you. That as you're walking through your weeks, your months, the routine of your life with Christ, remember that focus. Remember to shift it back to Jesus. Because look, the truth is, and I know this so well, it's so easy for our focus to shift back to what's happening in our lives, isn't it? To like kind of the, the pretty stressful things that are going on. About two months ago, I found out the company that I work for was closing down. Not awesome news in the middle of an economy that's trying to recover from a pandemic, is it? And so my initial response is, it's okay, God's going to come through. But then as the weeks creep along, who knows what I'm talking about, God's going to come through. Then you have that panic moment, I don't think God's going to come through. (laughs) Like, what's going on here, Lord? And in those moments, we've got to remind ourselves, no, 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 I'm going to look to you, Jesus. I'm going to look to you, Jesus. This is a pretty bad problem. Remember the original story in the book of Numbers, surrounded by poisonous snakes. This is a pretty bad problem, but I'm called to look to Jesus. My focus is on him. Now, here's the great news is that two weeks ago, I found out that I got a new job. Brilliant. So that's really encouraging. But you know what? Even if that hadn't happened straight away, my focus is still on Jesus, isn't it? Looking to him. And my final uh, point for us today is this. That a reborn life is a new life. It's a new life. Now, might sound like Captain Obvious again there, but I want to unpack this thought for us. 
Oswald Chambers, who is a beautiful, brilliant Christian minister and author, he says this, If Jesus is a teacher only, then all he can do is tantalize us by erecting a standard we cannot come anywhere near. But if by being born again from above, we know him first as saviour, we know that he did not come to teach us only. He came to make us what he teaches we should be. The Sermon on the Mount is a statement of the life we will live when the Holy Spirit is having his way with us. A reborn life is a new life. When we consider all of these things that we've looked at in this passage of Scripture, that it doesn't matter how we come to Jesus, that just that we come to Him, that we do need to be reborn, that God loves us, that there shifts our focus, there is a result. All of that brings a result in our lives, and it is something that is different. It's something that is different. This back end of Scripture that we read that John writes is rather interesting, isn't it? I'm going to read it again. And he says here to us, as he's talking about the idea of uh, humanity and our human condition, and he says this, there is no judgment in verse 18 against anyone who believes in him, speaking of Jesus, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world. I love that statement. But people love the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. It's a pretty full on statement, but if we were to be brutally honest with ourselves, we'd know, man, there is a broken bit in me, hey, that does, it it likes to do the things that I don't want it to do. Paul laments in that in scripture when he says, I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I want to do. And this image is um, like I was thinking about it. Uh, quite a number of years ago, probably about 10 or 12 years ago, Christy and I, my wife, went on a holiday when our eldest daughter was really young. And um, we'd been given, given, (laughs) it's such a funny, when I tell you it's going to be funny to you, hopefully. (laughs) I'm laughing at it already, I haven't even told you. Um, We'd been given by these beautiful people. It was like, hey, have a week away at our caravan um, up on the um, Port Stephens Way. They added, like, we're doing some renovations on it, but it's pretty good. So, We get in there at night, late, after driving in the pouring rain, and we came in and we flicked on the light. Oh, man, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. There are cockroaches scurrying for the dark corners in this half-built caravan. And I'm just like, whoa. Christy turns to me and she's like, we are not sleeping here tonight. And I'm like, fair enough, babe, fair enough. So I ended up finding somewhere else to stay. But, but when I read this passage of Scripture, I'm reminded of that moment because it's like lights come into the world. But the broken part of us runs away from that, hey, scurries into the dark corners. And here's what uh, John continues to write. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, as I said, but people loved the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. In verse 20, all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. Now listen to this in verse 21. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. When you hear that, honestly, for me, my mind goes to, oh, I've got to try to do the right things. Can I just be honest with you today? That's what I instantly go to. And then I think, oh, but I don't do the right things. Oh, man, do you know what I mean? You get caught in that loop in your thinking. What John is saying here is that a reborn life, because take it in the context of this conversation Christ has had with Nicodemus. Who was the person who could say he's actually probably doing everything right super religious guy yet even he needs to be reborn so what Christ is saying and John then comments upon is that a life that is reborn is new a life that is reborn is changed a life that is reborn is now ready to one run towards the light because that life lives a different way It doesn't live a different way to get God's love. It lives a different way because it's received God's love. You see, it doesn't live a a different way to 
prove its belief in Christ. Because it believes in Christ, it starts to look different. And if you get that twisted around, you're going to find yourself caught up in a cycle of religion that leads to nothing but disappointment, frustration, guilt, and shame. But can I tell you this? Scripture tells us there is now no condemnation. For those who are in Jesus Christ. So even if you're at the scatter party right now thinking, man, last night I made some pretty dumb decisions and I've just got myself here. I'm so glad you're here. We are so pumped you're with us because can I tell you, you need to hear it. I need to hear this every day. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's not about our efforts. It's about what he's done for us because a reborn life is a new life. It looks, it smells, it tastes, it is different. And I want to kind of give you this, well, not kind of, I'm going to give you this last question. Dare I be so bold as give you this last question, hey? (laughs) Particularly for people who have known Jesus for quite a while, this question's for you. So if you're just maybe checking this whole faith thing out, you go check if the croissants are cooked now, that's cool. But I want to encourage those that have walked with Jesus, maybe for a little while, how does your life look different since you've been reborn, since you've met Christ? I want to leave that with you. It's kind of a confronting question because, to be honest, when I was thinking about this myself, my initial response was, oh, well, you know, I I read my Bible, I, I go to church I I pray sometimes when I'm angry in the car I put on worship music like I'm thinking about all of these actions but truly isn't it about what's changed on the inside and my character that shifts as Pastor James was saying last week isn't it about the fruit of the Holy Spirit present more and more in our life isn't it about love joy peace patience kindness faithfulness gentleness and self-control like uh, are they the things that we're seeing that are shifting in our lives because of this rebirth it's really easy to jump back to religious acts but if they aren't motivated by relationship Man, they fall on the ground pretty quickly, don't they? They dry up rather swiftly. So I want to encourage you. And my prayer is that today this is an encouragement for us because this is really good news. Like I said at the start, this is really good news because we don't have to now find our lives dictated to by an endless list of religious duties. Instead, no matter where we are at, no matter what life has looked like right up to this point, we can come to Christ, know that he loves us and that our belief in him brings a rebirth in us, that we are reborn and that in that we live a completely new life that is evident to those around us. As John finishes in that passage, he says in verse 21, talking about those that are stepping towards the light. And I love that idea. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Their lives are a testimony to others about God's goodness, his faithfulness, and his great immersive love. We're just going to pray together right now before we finish up today. So why don't you join me? Father God, I thank you for your great love. I thank you that you love us, that you care for us and that you know us and you love us all the same. Even those dark, broken, evil parts, the bits of us that are still shattered, you love us, all of us. And you are longing for us to come to you so that you can put us back together. And not only that, so that we can be reborn in your son, Jesus Christ. I ask that this week, Whatever challenges we might be facing, God, whether they are with finances or family or career, whatever they might be, whether they are relational or health-wise, I pray that you would help us shift our focus away from our problems and towards our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and that in that we would find great peace, great comfort, and great hope. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.